Make sense? Good. All right. Well then, <clears throat> today let's keep going and go to the organic chemistry. So this is new stuff. We're gonna go through the carbs, the fats, the proteins. Ah, that's um. Did you do that tracking thing? The food tracking. Good. After the lecture, that's gonna be homework. We gotta hand it in, but do it after the lecture, and then. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll check it off and for, for completeness and then give it back to you. That way you have it. It's your stuff. But today we're going to go a little bit more in the chemicals, uh, chemical uh, makeup of these, these foods we eat. <clears throat> Large molecules in the body, the organic molecules, they're large. They're carbon-based, and they come in mostly in the in the body. They're in forms of polymers. Poly means many. The polymer is a chain of sim, sim, uh, uh, monomers put together. Monomers are one unit. So when you, for example, eat a, 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 a carbohydrate. You're eating polymers, you're eating longer chains, you're eating these long molecules, bigger molecules, and from then, then, we break them down and make monomers, make single units out of them. So mono means one. Poly means many. So polymers are large molecules made up of monomers, and monomers are when we break apart the polymers so here is a picture. See, one of these is a monomer. All of them together is a polymer. And that could be the way I'm going to draw a protein, by the way. I mean, it looks a little schematic, but that's how they do it. So then we make polymers. So we take monomers. And we put them together and we make a polymer. And that's a bigger molecule. And what we have to do when we do that, we have to do the process called dehydration synthesis. So we're synthesizing. And we're making something. So now what we do is we take, we have, if you look at, if you look at the molecules, let's see, if you look at, that's a molecule, that's a monomer. If you look at that monomer and you want to take another one and put it next to one another, make two out of it, make this polymer out of it, you have to make a bond between the monomer one and the monomer two. How you're going to make a bond is going to have a reaction of some valence electron things. That's how we make bonds. And, but in order to do that, you're going to have to take a little thing from one molecule and a little thing from the other molecule, and then you stick them together. And when we take two monomers, on one of them, we have to remove an OH. And on the other one, we have to remove an H. That's always the way it goes. When we take those together, we got to make water. So when we want to make a bigger molecules from two smaller ones, we're going to have to sort of squeeze a little water out of it, and then it can bond together. So they call that dehydration synthesis. So you dehydrate. Hydration is water, right? D means away. So you take away that, that water from the molecules to bond it together. I know, it sounds a little weird, but that's how I look at it. Because when you then want to make break down a polymer, you're going to do that by what they call hydrolysis. And the word lysis, that's a good one to learn, by the way. We're going to have they come up a lot, that word. Lysis means to separate or to kill also, depending on what we do. So we have a polymer now, and if we want to separate them and make monomers out of it, we have to now take the OH and the H, which is the water, and stick one back on one monomer and the other one on the other monomer. We've got to replenish it. 
Otherwise, it's going to be empty. It's not going to like it. So when you combine two molecules, you have to extract something from each of them to be able to do that. And when you want to separate and make them again, you will have to add back on something to make them complete as individual molecules. So that's how we do that in the body. Dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. Now let's go from there to the carbohydrates. Because those processes we have all, with all those other molecules, we're going to have these dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis processes. Carbohydrates are rings of carbon. They look like that. They're rings. Fats will be chains. Carbohydrates are rings. And I'm not going to make you do this chemical formula thing, but one thing that's very interesting is it's carbons and then we attach hydrogens and oxygens. That's really it. And so the ratio between hydrogen and oxygen is the same ratio in a glucose molecule as it is in water. It's a two to one ratio. We have two hydrogens for one oxygen. And that makes a carbohydrate, like a sugar, like table sugar, dissolve in water. Because it's the same thing that, from that perspective. So we're going to call that hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. So carbohydrates like water. Hydro means water, philic means loving. That is a very important thing in the body. A lot of the chemical processes are based in the fact, or is this molecule water loving or water fearing? It's like the oil and the vinegar in the salad dress. They're separate. So carbohydrates can be the vinegar. They don't separate out from water because of that ratio is the same. We got a lot of carbs, so when you do your, your, your your um, reflection on what you eat, you know, then we got the good carbs and we got the bad carbs. And then all of them in between. We got these people, they say, you know, disease is pretty much carb. We have too many carbs. What do you want to change in your diet? Just change the damn carbs. Get rid of them. Uh, but I think that's a little bit simplistic. But we definitely want to move away from, we want to move in this direction a little bit. Rather have a salad than a Coke. But it's the same basic thing. Except, well, let's get to that in a moment. When we go a little bit deeper into the chemistry, since this is chemistry, we're looking at carbohydrates as a single unit, as a monomer, is known as a monosaccharide. Saccharide refers to sugar. We got a few of those monosaccharides. We got glucose. We heard of glucose. You got high fructose corn syrup. Oh no, just fructose. You heard of that fructose thing, right? Then we got galactose. That has to do with milk, sugar stuff. And then we got a couple more. We got ribose and deoxyribose. Those actually are going to be in our DNA which we'll have a brief talk about um, at the end today. Glucose is the body's universal cellular fuel. That means when we talk about how to make energy in the body, we're pretty much going to take a glucose and see how much energy we get out of that glucose. So that's our measuring unit for that. Well, we need that to be able to get energy. So those are monosaccharides. Now when we take two of those together, we make a disaccharide out of it. So you take two monomers, make a disaccharide. Di means two. Saccharide again reads to sh uh, is sugar. And, and we make two by dehydration synthesis. So you squeeze a little water out of it, get these two connected. We got a few ones. We got 
The important ones for us are cane sugar or sucrose, milk sugar or lactose, malt sugar or maltose. So we got sucrose, that's the table sugar, the cane sugar, that's the glucose and the fructose. That's nice. The glucose gives us energy and the fructose tastes good. The, the sweetie taste is the, is the fructose. Because you take maltose and add the glucose and the glucose, that doesn't taste that good. Mm. So in the body, what we're going to do is we're going to get, well, we're going to get um, many chains. We're going to get these, um, we, we eat starches, polysaccharides. They're looking like that. And then there are all these sugars attached to it. And then when we eat and chew and all that, we'll break them down. We'll first break them down to disaccharides. And then lastly, we take them down to monosaccharides. And then the body can absorb them into the bloodstream. So that's that breaking down process. But then also, once it's inside the body, we can connect glucose molecules again to one another and make energy storage out of that and store them that way. A little, not that much storage, but a little bit because when we need it, we can just chop it off and put it in the, put it in the bloodstream and glucose is our universal fuel, so it gives us energy real fast. That's when he sees an athlete chewing on a, you know, on a little piece of sugar. Something that goes in the bloodstream real fast and they get energy fast because they're running out of it. Mostly the liver stores this stuff because the liver is sort of the organ that has direct access to everything. We got a lot of also in muscle. The muscle uses a lot of energy. And we got some storage apparently in brain. That's uh, newer knowledge. And a storage, a polysaccharide in the body as a storage molecule is called a glycogen. Glycogen. I don't know, see here, glycogen. Starch is what we eat, glycogen, and then cellulose is the plant stuff that we can eat. The fiber that goes right back out, but it's really helpful for us to eat because we can't digest it. So that brings us to the food problem with sugar. And the food problem with sugar is the fact that at some point in the 90s, some dumbass decided we're gonna have a food pyramid because we need agriculture. We have people who need work. And I don't know, monoculture. No, it's monoculture, that's the problem. It's all Nixon's fault. It's all Nixon's fault. Not Trump's, Nixon's. Um, 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 but what the food pyramid told us, eat bread. Eat a lot of bread. Then eat more, eat a lot of bread, bad carb sort of stuff. Then eat some better carbs, sort of stuff. Then go to the protein and um, a little bit of the fats and all that, and then eat the sweet, so then the candy. But that just doesn't work out because we have this fat free diet, sort of thing, with overeating of carbs because fat makes us satisfied, carbs don't make us satisfied. We're gonna go picking out on them, and so we're blowing up. Uh, and so we have to we have to sort of reverse that a little bit. At least now we got the plate, so that's good. We're moving away. But what's interesting is you actually look up what happens to the obesity epidemic since '92 is when everything exploded. There's some funny YouTube sorry that just like shows the maps as they get redder and redder and redder, and it's it's apparently all based on that. And so we want to use that information and understand that information. And I thought maybe a little bit more knowledge will help with that. So if we take sugar into the body, we have the carbohydrates, they're broken down into glucose, and then the cell will make the energy. So that's baseline. Energy will learn is ATP, that molecule will learn. The more processed a carb is, that means the less salad it is. That means the more Oreo cookie it is. The simpler the sugar, the faster it gets broken down by chemical digestion, and the faster that it reaches the bloodstream. So, the sugar rises in the bloodstream fast, that means the pancreas will have to make insulin fast, 
because that's the chemical that tells the cells to take up the, glu the glucose into the cells from the bloodstream. Because the problem is sugar in the bloodstream makes the blood sticky, viscous. You can only imagine, sticky blood's not gonna be good. Look at that, it's gonna clog all the crap and that's when you look at all the diabetes stuff, that's all the problems. Because when you keep eating stuff, these, these, these carbs fast, like the donut thing in the morning with the coffee, so the blood sugar goes up real fast. The insulin goes up real fast. And then what happens is the sugar tanks down and goes below what was zero, and we go, oh, sugar blues. And then you fall asleep, and you can focus, and you need to eat more fast. That's another hint. If you eat a donut, and after an hour you go eat another donut, and maybe not a great, go for an egg. That might be a little better. Uh, uh, this is a good carb. This is probably a regular, you know, good old egg omelet or something for breakfast. Hardy breakfasts are really recommended. Um, um, and look at the sugar goes not as fast, not as high, not as fast and not as high, and the insulin doesn't overshoot it, so it doesn't go below, and so you have much less lower lasting energy. So that's sort of good to understand and play with that a little bit. So, you know, go, go uh, and, eat and pig out on some crappy sugary stuff, and then you get over yourself, and, and, and then you look at the glycemic index, and a glycemic index indicates of how fast does the sugar go to the bloodstream. And so 100 is table sugar. And then you got a white bagel goes faster into the bloodstream than table sugar. That's good to know. So you eating a bagel, you might as well sit in there chewing on sugar. Hmm. And so that's like, that's a, I like this list. I, I changed it a little bit. I like this list because you have, you have some good ones that you can, you can see. And it's not all good. It's not all bad. We don't have to always be on top of it. I even read today, no, that, oh, that was in the radio thing. Uh, sourdough bread is better than the other one. It goes, the, blo the blood sugar dealing is better than if it's just, thank you, San Francisco. That's all I can say. So the glycemic index is interesting. If you, the other thing that I've learned is if you look at, at artificial sweeteners, the like the okai, okai what, no, what is that? Um, some of the syrups, if they only have fructose in it, they go like, they look way good on the glycemic index, but they're totally messing you up because the glucose is not there. So it doesn't measure the glucose because glycemic index measures the glucose. The fructose is what makes you feel sweet. That's why the high fructose corn syrup, have you heard of that? How that's bad? It's not really that bad, it's just so cheap. So they put it everywhere. Because in the table sugar, your ratio of fructose and glucose is 50-50. In a high fructose corn syrup, it's 45-55. So it's not that different, but it's cheap. And so they put it in all the stuff. And so that's why we want to knock it out uh, and I think about 60% of our foods we buy at the grocery stores have sugar added on it. 60% of the foods. Grocery store, go to the outside, not to the center. The way they make a grocery store in America, right? The center is the eye stuff and the outside is the vegetables. So always go in the perimeter, periphery. Yeah, so that's pretty good stuff. I like the, um, and then, of course, after a while, when we do this, this up and down thing, the pancreas wears out. So you, you know, and then they give you some medicine to make the pancreas work harder. And then you call yourself a good Christian. Be, but you're abusing your own body and then you kick it to, you know, with the medicine. It's not, I mean, we have to be a little bit thinking about it. Just thinking about it. You know, and then we, thinking about it already makes us behave differently. And so that's why I'm so mean to make you write all that stuff down. Um, on, on, the, on the last booklet, which not everybody has, but many people have now, the top link, did you ever look at the back page of these things? Because I have, they're all different TED Talks. So you just scan a phone if you feel bored or whatever. Those are my favorites. That's why I put them in. So I always have them for me to, to, to do that. But on the last booklet, 
The top left is actually not a TED Talk, it's NPR. Good old boring NPR. But it's on food. Eat your way to a healthier life. It's like four 25 minute segments, podcasts with, uh, with uh, really good experts on it. And it's simple, straightforward, sensible, not on a South Beach diet, whatever thing that we don't understand anyway. It costs a lot of money, right? It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. So that then, from the carbs, now we're moving to the fats. Now we're gonna go a little bit um, technical again for a second. Fats, lipids, lipids, are a large diverse group of organic compounds. They're mostly carbon and hydrogen. They don't have much oxygen. That makes them insoluble in water. They are the, vin the oil, not the vinegar in a salad dressing. They call that hydrophobic. They run away from water. They fear the water. Phobia, you know phobia, right? Hydrophobia. Oil and water don't mix. So the, the main one, the first one we'll talk about is a triglyceride, also known as neutral fat. Tri means three. Glyceride refers to this glycerol. So these are like when you look at these molecules, here is one. They look like an E, a large letter E. So they got this back thing. It's the same here, it just says glycerol. This is just a chemical formula looking, so you have an example. So they have this backbone, they call it the glycerol backbone, and then three fatty acid chains coming out of it, like that. And these can be as long as we want them to be. See here, it says dot, dot, dot. That means uh, endless, long, long. These are, have you ever heard of omega-3s fatty acids? Yeah. There are some of these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're, and so these carbons, these, these C's are connected with covalent bonds. That's the holding hand bond thing. So a covalent bond is actually an interesting thing because you can have one electron holding hands or you can have two or three or four. And so the more, the stronger the bond gets. If you have one holding hands, these molecules, they can freely rotate around one another and circle. If you have two or more, they're stuck in position. They're either cis or trans. That's what they call those. And that's actually where that, that cis trans stuff comes in the language from um, uh, that we use these days. And so when, when look at this, also funny how they write this. This is this glycerol molecule and then these are the carbon chains so they don't actually even write carbons anymore they just make one carbon two carbon they just write weeklies like that and so that's representing a carbon chain and so in in some instances all these carbon chains have only single bonds they only have one holding hand bond so those molecules they all rotate freely and so these 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 uh, long chains coming out they are sitting nice and parallel to one another so those become our fats because they're nicely packed together and this makes them at room temperature uh, stable. So they're butter. You take it out of the fridge, it's too hard. Dude, the first time I came to America, I was like, that was a while back now. The first fridge, it had a heated butter compartment in the fridge. That was great. You put the fridge out, you, take it, it, you can spread it. But it's like, what a waste of whatever, right? You have a fridge, and then you have a heater inside the fridge to make sure the bottle's not too cold. That was from the 50s. That was great. Um, anyway, that's, that's the reason. The reason why butter is butter in room and not oil is because these E's are really parallel. They're very compact. Because then what happens is you have something, sometimes there is two hands, and all of a sudden you've got a kink. It's not parallel anymore. And that uses more space. And that more space usage makes this oily at room temperature and not solid. It's more occupying more space. It's physical space. A lot of this has to do with, with how it looks physically. It's a structural question, how these things happen. So that's the difference between oil and fat, or between unsaturated and saturated fats. Unsaturated fats are the oils. There is something we can eat more of, like olive oil, they say is good for you. 
And then they say, you know, butter is not so good for you. But then you got Julia Childs, and she was in her 90s, and everything had butter on it. So I don't know about this butter thing. I like butter. Oh, and then, 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 then we had the 60s and the 70s, and the chemists think, and they didn't think, right? And they think they know everything. And so they came up with margarine. And margarine is not a food. Have you noticed that? It, like you eat it, it's plasticky. Just don't buy it. So what happens is they are, what they wanted to do is they wanted to make vegetable oil solid at room temperature. So they had to manipulate that. But they wanted you to be able to eat oil and put it on bread and it's a vegetable and it's not a fat. It's not the saturated thing that clogs your artery and makes you all dead fast. And so they came up with this way of making vegetable oils into solid at room temperature. And so they manipulated these kink things. You're not supposed to manipulate these kink things. Because when the humans do that, it's not the God doing it or nature doing it, and the body doesn't recognize it anymore. And so we eat these kind of trans fats, then they become the margarines, these trans fats. And the body doesn't recognize them. And the body gets all out of whack and creates these, these things like cardiovascular disease that gets bad and random. The inflammatory responses are, 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 are out of hand. And so you need to be aware that, and wait a minute, am I going to the prostaglandins? Yes, I am. Okay, great. We'll talk a little more about it. But these trans fats are the ones you really never want to eat because they also stay in the body and sort of stay behind for over what, 50 days. And unfortunately, that's your Dorito chips. <laughs> I know, I know. So when we look at fats, we want to like be really, really careful that these trans fats and these, or hydrogenated oils, they call them, and they put more hydrogens on it, we want to avoid them. So we can eat our, in those pockets, cheese, the verdict, the pearl is out on cheese. Cheese is not necessarily bad, depends who you ask. So we want to be, you know, spare, not all the time, but, you know, we don't eat meat every day. Meat once a week used to be okay. But these things, we need to be really working on it. And, and let me go a little deeper. Why? When we go a little deeper, we have these three type of hormones, localized hormone things they call prostaglandins. So when we look at hormones, these are chemicals that influence body function. And... The prostaglandins come from the fatty acids. And we have three of them that we really look at. We have families. We have prosta one, prostaglandin two, and three. One are the plant oils, like the olive oil. Two are the meats and the dairies, and then the trans fats. And three are the cold weather oils, like uh, uh, walnut is good, for example, and uh, cold water fish. And so, some of them help us increase inflammation, some of them decrease inflammation. We need to have them be balanced in the body. Don't you like that picture? I know, right? Uh, the problem is we eat a lot of prostaglandin twos, the red meats and the trans fats. We do not eat the ones and the threes enough. That's why we need more omega threes. Omega sixes are the twos. Omega three is the threes. And so, um, see that the three, the twos make more, the red meat, more inflammation, and then we have more degenerative diseases like diabetes and heart disease, autoimmune disease. And then the trans fats, the reason why they are so bad, these are saturated also, that's why we limit them. The trans fats though, in this category, are the worst because they don't just give us more prostaglandin too, but they limit the usefulness of these. So you completely go out of balance. And so that's when then all of a sudden these are these acute heart attacks that happen. And all of a sudden the body's taken over by some response like that. Um, and that's why I'm on it. So next time, next time you go and buy one of those, you keep one.
Or you look and see, look at the trans fats. Oh my God. Never mind. And then you keep walking. And don't even think just giving it to the kids. Not going to help. So that's food for thought. That's definitely prostaglandins are not on the test. But I think it's important to understand it a little bit. I know. And then I, and I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm such a, a food party pooper. Also, though, in the fat family is the phospholipid. And the phospholipid is, is, is most amazing because now, instead of having this glycerol backbone and these things coming out like we have with the um, triglycerides, right? In this instance, we have a glycerol backbone. We have two of those chains coming out. But then on the other side, we have something completely different. So on this side, we're going to have a, 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 a molecule that has a phosphate in it. That's why it's called a phosphate. Um, and that is actually loving water. That's water loving. That's hydrophilic. And then this is our regular fat. And so that's hydrophobic. That does not like water. So now I got a molecule. And the body is kind of water inside, up to here mostly. So it's really a water environment. But now I've got a molecule that on one side is, wa is watery, on the other side it's oily. And I can use that for my, oops, shoot. Where did I go? Here I go. I can use that to my benefit because I can take two of those suckers, like here. That, that's how they depict them. They just look at the tails and the other one, so they have these, these what do they call it, the hydrophobic tails and the hydrophilic heads. But they take two of these and they point the tails towards one another, and that creates an oil film. This is oily, and on the outside we got water. We can be in water. This is perfect. We're going to use that to go around every cell and make a nice cell membrane that is an oil film and that's a boundary and remember one of the functions of life is to have a boundary so that's our cell boundary that we can create so I'm thinking it's like it's like an ocean there's just buoys swimming in there nothing can go through it's kind of like that it's like the oil film it swims in the water environment it's fluid it's motion it's flexible but nothing can really penetrate that we don't want on the inside. So the outside and the inside are two distinct environments. So that's brilliant. So, you know, don't tell me oil and fat's bad, right? It's very, very important. Phospholipid bound uh, bilayer. So that makes a great cell membrane, a great boundary, two rows of hydrophobic nonpolar tails pointing at each other, making that hydrophobic oil film. And that way, no, nothing polar can go through it. Does that make sense? Make sense? Yeah? Good. Am I boring yet? No? I'm almost done, I think. Um, we have more fat, though. We have steroids. And that's, all, that's a functional fat molecule. It look, looks totally different. But it, it, it's mostly carbon and hydrogen, so it's also hydrophobic. So we'll, We'll put it in that category. Look at that, that's a whole different looking thing. That's not an E shape of any kind. That's cholesterol. What? A functional thing? Cholesterol? I thought that was really horrible. Well, not really. We have to sort of differentiate. Um, we need cholesterol. It's a building block to many molecules like vitamin D, our sex hormones, cortisol, that is a stress hormone. Aldosterone, that is a water balancing type hormone. So it's a lot of stuff. It's, it's also all in the cell membrane. What we learn about cholesterol is we have these two types that we look at. And we have one called LDL and one called HDL. And they're actually lipoproteins, though those are um, um, round structures that have only one phospholipid layer 
and all the things, all the legs point to the inside. So on the inside you have oil, and the outside it's in a water environment. So that's what a lipoprotein is. And the LDL are carrying fat from the liver to the body. And the HDL carry fat from the body to the liver for processing. And so remember when we do cholesterol, have you, 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 you have total cholesterol, right? Have you done cholesterol yet? Total cholesterol, and then you got HDL and LDL. And one is good and one is bad. So the LDL is bad because it distributes the fat in the body, from the liver to the body. The HDL is good because it picks up the fat and brings it to the liver for processing. So the HDL is like a vacuum cleaner. Pick it up. So that's why that is different. That's why that is good or bad. But we have to be careful to understand that cholesterol is the foundation for a lot of functional molecules, things that influence, like hormones or vitamin D. Very, very important. So you know that's where eggs went kind of out of style and now they're back in style. I went to a cardiovascular seminar and they want you to eat 12 eggs a week. Almost two a day. Because apparently eggs have very, very much good cholesterol in it. It's got a high total cholesterol count, but it's mostly HDL when eggs apparently came out of style. We didn't differentiate yet. We just said it's bad. It took all this time. And so when you go buy eggs, spend your money on eggs. Buy pastured eggs. Pay a little bit for the eggs. Makes a big difference. It makes a big difference what the, the, the hen ate to what the eggs content is. And pasture means they're walking around on the outside. That's even better than free cage. I mean cage free or organic. I've learned that. So that's what I've found. I'm spending my money on eggs. I bought some stock in that too. Um, so from there, we're going to go to the proteins. That's the next thing we eat. There are meats and legumes. They have carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, some sulfur. A little bit more than just the first three. But same ratio as water. They are dissolvable in water. So they're hydrophilic. They like water. Construction work material. It it constructs the body, and not the bone, but like tendons and stuff like that. Uh, and it also does work, like antibodies and hormones, and, and, um, and uh, some hormones are, are proteins. So the, here's a list of all the stuff that proteins do. Um, we'll go through all of this stuff as we get through the body. The building block of hormone of proteins are amino acids. So amino acids look like this. They have this and this and this and this. All these look the same in all the amino acids, and this R group is a virion group. So a lot of the way that, that all of these 20 different amino acids look, there's 20 different ones we use in the body. They're all listed here. But they're all looking like this, and then this piece is different. So in many ways, chemically, they react similarly, how they make them, you know, how to make them break the proteins. And so, and so they all, when we make a protein, we take many of these and put them all one next to one another. And so they call that a polypeptide chain. I know, more words. Poly means many, though. So at least we got that. Um, 12 of these 20 different amino acids that we need to make proteins, we, we, we can make, the body can make themselves. So they can make these. But not all of them, eight of them cannot be made. I've listed them here, but you don't have to learn all these names. Don't worry about that. But if you want to look them up, there they are. Tryptophan, somewhere. Um, but eight we have to eat. And they come most complete in meats. And that's where vegans run into trouble if they don't balance out the proteins that they eat. It's not that vegetables don't have much protein. Vegetables have tons of protein, depends on what we eat. But it's the balancing of the essentials that we have to be careful, that we don't undernourish. 
Because if we have four missing, we have a few missing here. That's a different protein. And that can make every difference. Um, oh, yeah. But the, 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 the determinant of what protein you have in the body, it's determined by what amino acid comes after the other. So the amino acid sequence determines the protein's function. That is very important because when we get to DNA, the genes in our body, the genetic, the hereditary material, all that is is a cookbook for proteins. Remember that two thing going up, that, that helix? All that is is telling the body what amino acid to put after another, to put after another, to put after another. So that's interesting. So it's not all in the genes. We gotta be careful about that. I told the genetic professor once, it's not in the genes, it's in the tensegrity, and she says, yeah, you're right. That's like, oh, that's boring. But some of these things are much more complicated. Tensegrity is like, how do you stand, how everything pulls on one another? All these collagen fibers internally, it's very interesting. When we look at protein, we have different, oh, I did it this way. We have different structures, or different levels, the first is a primary level of structure. That's just that amino acid sequence. But then when you have that long of amino acid, stuff starts happening. It starts wiggling up a little bit. It either gets into a telephone cable looking thing or into a sheet, like an accordion looking thing. And so they call that a secondary structure. And then from there, some of these these are then these, this is, let's say, this is a telephone cable right here, just depicted. But then some of these internal structures pull on one another. These are these hydrogen bonds very often. And they wiggle up and they make them three-dimensional looking. And so that's the tertiary structure. Like, uh, and then a quaternary structure is just when we have a few of those pro subproteins come together. Like a hemoglobin. It's four units and then it's a hemoglobin. What's interesting is um, some proteins are fibrous, they're structural, like a tendon, like the Achilles tendon. He said, well, cable. That's structural protein, it's all fibrous protein. That sort of stop, that, that stop here, more or less, in the development. And then the other proteins, as they get three-dimensional more, or globular, they become functional proteins, like they do things versus just provide strength. And that's like a, the hemoglobin, for example, or antibodies, or hormones, too. Oh, look, here are the enzymes. Enzymes are all globular proteins. Fibrous protein are stable, globular protein are not. You take the egg, it's clear, you put it on the stove, it gets white immediately, denaturing the globular protein. You go onto the beach, you find a carcass, you look around, you even still, you have some tens laying around. Fibrous protein. The sun does not destroy it. I, I know, it's a little macabre, but that's... I got a seal skeleton at the office. Yeah. <laughs> it looks really good. It's good, good, good degeneration on it. You know, it's good to see things. Anyway, that brings me back to the enzymes. We talked about the enzymes already. I think we just read this. Let's see. They're biological catalysts. They increase the rate of chemical reaction they do not become part of the reaction. No, part of the product. I didn't say that far yet. In the other picture, this is similar, right? The substrate comes together, it works on the ball, and it makes two out of it. This enzyme does not change. You can reuse this over and over. I didn't say that in the first time. Reactive, mo reactive molecules bind to properly shaped active sites. It is the shape, the physical shape, that determines which enzyme works for what substrate. I always have to remember that because it's so small, I don't think of it being physical. Um, <clears throat> that way, we want it to be very specific because we, want it not, we don't want one enzyme to work for multiple different reactions. How are we going to control what's going on in the body that way? It's a matter of control. So it's very specific in action. Um, we talked about this already, but then there's one more piece here. 
when you see a word like oxidase or hydrolase or lipase or whatever ase 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 at the end means it's an enzyme and in some enzymes you are not active like in your stomach you don't want to have an active enzyme that breaks down protein when there's no protein there they're going to break down your stomach wall there's protein in the stomach wall so that enzyme needs to be present but only active when protein is present so the the stomach enzyme that breaks down protein is pepsin like pepsi pepsin but if it's inactive, it's called pepsinogen. It has the G-E-N at the end, like in Genesis, the creation of the world. So that means it's not quite finished. Pepsinogen is not active, doesn't do anything. What has to happen is we're gonna have hydrochloric acid come in, stomach acid, that you know heartburn, you know stomach acid, and that activates the pepsinogen and makes pepsin and that digests protein. But only if protein is present to be digested, not if not. And so that's another way how we can control how an enzyme works, having an active and inactive form. And the reason why, we don't wanna to have to be making all of a sudden, making a lot of pepsin because all of a sudden there's protein present. You wanna have it there and activate it when you need it by switching one little thing. And that's what that does. So the HCL is strong enough to just switch that over. So that's the enzyme. I like enzymes. So look for ASCs and GENs. Pepsin and pepsinogen. And look, that brings me to the genetics. The DNA stuff. And nucleic acid make up our genes. Which is the hereditary material. Which is the cookbook for protein. That's all it is. I mean, that's a lot, because that's all the enzymes. And all the enzymes is what does all the work. So you got long, long strands of this making every protein in the body. And so let's go a little deeper how that looks. So the building blocks of a nucleic acid, or a DNA thing, is nucleotides. And we have four of them that connect with one another by a hydrogen bonds and they make up that double, uh, 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 double helix. So we got, look, we have adenine, we have guanine, we have cytosine, and we have thymine. Oh, great. All these names. Well, we have thymine, we have adenine, we have cytosine, we have guanine. They're just yellow, green, red, and blue. That's much better. So they are, they are the ones that come in on the wrong, on the, on the double helix, and come from the outside in, and they have to, each of them has to connect with another one. And they're very specific who can connect with whom. So only adenine can hook up with thymine, right here, and thylacine goes with uh, guanine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't even speak it out. So they call them the complementary bases. So now what happens is you've got to have these things on two sides. So you have this double helix. It's actually two times the same thing, pretty much, in reverse. One goes forward, the other goes backwards. Because we've got all these sequences. So when we want to make a protein, we've got to go into this nucleus, into the cell, and go to this thing and rip it apart. And, apart, and take one strand and then Depending on what nucleotide comes after one another, that will then code for different amino acids to be put on one another. Right there, that's it. Protein synthesis, you got it. We do that on Wednesday with words. But so that's where that comes in as how that works is important. And then we make protein. But only the adenine and the thymine can respond to one another or can hook up to one another and the guanine and the cytosine. And so I need you to learn those complementary base pairs. I do not need you to know, oh, it's adenine or guanine. I just need you to recognize it on a test. That's multiple choice. So, and really what we need to know is who goes with whom. So the adenine goes with the thymine. So I say A, T, and T is my non-preferred telephone carrier. 
The internet sucks, my office. But that I remember. A goes with T. I, I will always remember at and It's a mnemonic. You know mnemonics, right? The stupider, the better. The easier it sits in the head. So go for it. And then the other one is the G and the Z. I just know those are two rounded letters. But that doesn't fly that well. So that's um, nucleic acids. And that brings us to the last piece. We'll talk more about this nucleotide stuff uh, uh, on Wednesday for sure in the cell chapter. Um, and I'm sure it'll come up a few times. But that could be one of the questions if it's a little hard to understand. So we'll go through it a few times. But last but not least in this chapter, we do need energy, lots of energy. And so energy is carried on a molecule in the body. It's known as adenosine triphosphate. What's important for us is not the adenosine. That's just an A here for us. What's important for us is the phosphates. So we got an adenosine and we got three phosphates attached to it. ATP, triphosphate. Tri means three. The way that these phosphates are attached to one another makes all the difference. Because right here, this bond right here, this third bond is a high energy bond. Oh, look right here, a lot of energy. So this bond right here is a high energy bond. So that means it's going to take a lot of energy to put it on that phosphate. But when I take it off, it's going to give me a lot of energy. So I'm going to split off a phosphate from the ATP right here. That's the split off. And that split of that bond gives me a lot of energy, and that moves my muscles. That's that energy. That's the fuel of the bond. So when that is broken by a hydrolysis, the energy liberated is a lot. And that way, then, we make it from a stored energy to a kinetic energy, from a potential energy to a kinetic energy. Then we can do work. So that's this down in here. And as a result, then, we're going to have not an ATP, but now we have an ADP. And the D stands for di, and that means two phosphates and not three phosphates. And then we can take the ADP and split a little bit of energy off right here, some energy, still some energy, if we're really desperate. And we make and with this call, we make an AMP, and that's an adenosine monophosphate. Mono means one. And then that energy, mo that molecule is not really an energy molecule, but that molecule is very vast, so it's used in the cell for some other processes sometimes. Like, say, the signal from the outside of the cell and the inside, if a hormone can't go through it, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's interesting. Well, the, one of the things that that, that shows me in the body is like we want to be using whatever we can for many things and be versatile. That's the cool thing about the body. That's that, I think. Does that make sense? Good. Do you have any questions? No, I know I let you sit in for a long time.